you, you're, you're, you're all capable of being world beaters. You transform yourself into something that's articulated and sensible and grounded in history and knowledgeable and wise, man. You can do anything you want and hopefully anything you want for good. Because if you have any sense, everything you want to do would be for the good. Because there's nothing more compelling or meaningful or, or useful in combating the tragedy of life than to, than to struggle with all your soul on behalf of the good. And the universities have forgotten that. It's why everyone's bailing out of the humanities. And they should. The humanities are corrupt. And they're corrupt because they're not telling students this. It's so bloody obvious. It's like, learn to think. Learn to speak. Learn to read. It makes you a superpower. An individual superpower. You have, and I don't understand why that isn't just told to students. It's not that hard to understand and everyone wants to hear it. It's like, really, I could do that? I could do that? It's like, yeah, really, you could do that. And the whole society around you has labored for really thousands of years to provide every single one of you with this spectacular opportunity that you have while you're undergraduates and graduate students here, man. They're just, everyone's just praying that you would come here and manifest everything that you could manifest. And that's what you should be doing instead of waving placards and complaining about how you're oppressed for God's sake. You see these Yale students complaining about their oppression. It's just, it just leaves me aghast. It's like, well, we're against the ruling class. It's like, no, 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 you're baby ruling class <laughs> members. You're young. <laughs> The only reason you're not rich is because you're young. You know, that's the best, really, that's the, if you look at the 1% even, the, the dreaded 1%, you know, most of those people are old. Why? Well, when you progress through life, if you're reasonably successful, you trade in your promising youth for your wealthy old age, but you're still bloody old. Would you, would you trade it? Would you trade your youth for that? Like if you factor age out of the economic equation, things look a lot different. Well, of course older people have more money. If they have any sense, they've been collecting it for their whole life. Is that somehow unfair? It's not unfair unless you want to want to be poverty stricken when you're 70. And you, and you don't want to be poverty stricken, poverty stricken when you're 70. So I just don't understand what's happened to the universities. I can't mm -hmm. believe that you're not told when you come the first day, look, man, you are, you're here on a heroic mission you're going to take your capacity to articulate yourself to levels that are undreamed of. You're going to come out of here unstoppable. You're going to be able to do anything you want. It's like, that's what you're here for. Instead, you're taught that, well, you know, the world's a pretty oppressive place and you're probably the bottom of the victim pile and, 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 there's, and there's, oh, there's virtually nothing you can do about it except you know, deconstruct the patriarchy. And it's so weak deed and so pathetic that, that, that universities should be embarrassed that that's what they're peddling to students. I'm embarrassed by it. You know, I've, I've gone on public record telling parents, bloody well, send your boys to trade school because at least they'll learn something useful. And that's a terrible thing for someone like me to say because I do believe that, the art, that being articulated and educated in the highest possible manner is there's nothing that's better for you and for society. And why, are the, why have the universities forgotten this? Well, that's postmodern neo-Marxism for you, you know. That, then the philosophy of intense resentment and oppression and group identity and God, it's just pathetic. Dr. Peterson, I think a lot of students here would agree with you that one of the main purposes of uh, education at college, particularly at Harvard, is to develop their sense of articulation, their ability to read, their ability to crit uh, critically think. But then what comes after? Particularly at Harvard, there's a big discussion on what is a good life? What does it mean to use those skills that we get here and then we graduate? What do we do from there? Stop, and I think stop mm -hmm. unnecessary suffering. Mm -hmm. That's what you do, you know, that, so, that, that's your calling. It's like you say, well, what do you do after you graduate? Well, if you graduate articulated and powerful, there will be people giving you so many opportunities, you won't even be able to keep up with them. You know, and, and I've worked with comp very, very competent people in many different domains in my life, hyper-competent people. And I can tell you some very interesting things about hyper-competent people. The first thing is they are not selfish. 
and they're not greedy. And one of the great pleasures in their life is to find people who have the capacity to also be hyper-competent and to open doors for them as rapidly as they can possibly be open. They delight in that because there is, there's nothing, there's, there's very few things that are more intrinsically meaningful if you're an accomplished person than to find young people who have the possibility of being accomplished and say, hey, look, here's an opportunity for you. It's like, go out there, man, kill it. And then they go out there and kill it, and you think, right on, man. Here's another opportunity. Why don't you go out there and nail that, too? And you think, no, no, they're all hoarding their wealth, and they're not going to share it with anyone. It's like, that's absolute, complete rubbish. Mm -hmm. And so you don't even have to worry about what you're going to do after you graduate from here if you, if you turn yourself into half of what you could be, because people will be dying to offer you every opportunity that you can possibly make use of. So it's, it's, it's a moot point. The, the, the world is always desperately short of people who can think and speak. And, and you think, well, I, that, I won't be made use of. Well, you, first of all, you can't say that if you're, if you're a Harvard philosophy. I mean, people already figured out who you are. They've already figured it out. And they're offering you the world on a, on a gold platter. They take it. It's yours. Take it. It's like, great, man. Put yourself together and deserve it. That would be great. And that's what everyone wants. It's what your parents want. It's also what you want. You know it. It's what you want. It's what men, it's what women want from men. It's what men want from women. It's like for you to be who you could be. And, and the highest faculty of the human being is articulated speech. It, it's, it's the divine faculty. And there is nothing more powerful than that. There's nothing that's even in the same league. And so if you if you don't have faith in that, then your then your priorities are misplaced, and I, I can't even understand why you wouldn't have faith in that. Being say Harvard students, because look where it's got you already. You know, you're already sitting on top of the world. So make deserve it, make use of it. Right, go out there and fix things up. That's what you need to do. There's lots of things that need to be fixed up, and what you want to do is burden yourself with so much responsibility that you can barely stand. And then you'll get stronger trying to lift it up. And you won't be asking, what should I be doing with my life? Or what's the meaning of life? Or any of that. It'll be self-evident. Mm -hmm. It's self-evident. At minimum, you can say, there's more suffering in the world than there should be. And I could probably do something about that. And you can do something about that. So go do something about it. And then there'll be less suffering in the world. And then when you're 80, you can look back on your life and say, well, you know, there's less suffering in the world than there, than there would have been had I not existed. And, and you don't have to even have a, a sense of, of ultimate destiny or even any sort of theistic belief to regard that as a positive good. Like, I think it goes beyond the, the mere pragmatic utility of addressing the world's ill, because I think we do live in a, in, a, in a world that has a transcendent reality as well as the reality that we can detect. But even independently of that, it doesn't matter. Like, I mean, this is part of the reason I like people like Bill Gates is a great example, man. That guy, he's after five major diseases at the same time, right? He's trying to wipe out polio. He's trying to wipe out um, malaria. Yeah, exactly. He's trying to wipe out malaria. It's like, well, what should you do with your life? Well, you know, take a look at Bill Gates and see if you could do something like that. That would be good. <laughs> So Dr. Peterson, you talk about this idea of ending unnecessary suffering and this idea of committing one's life to that. At a minimum. I mean, that's At just an obvious yeah. thing that you could do. A lot of students, I think, accept that premise and view what they're doing as trying to eliminate or reduce unnecessary suffering. And they see activism or other forms of direct service as fulfilling that goal. Do you simply disagree with like the content of what they think, the, the tactic that they are using to end unnecessary suffering? Or do you think that their motives or their intentions are not even the same as yours? It's too public. You know, there's this, there's this, old, there's this old saying from the, from the New Testament about not praying in public. Hmm. Right? And the idea is that if you're going to commune for the higher good, you should do it private, because otherwise you're warping your ethic in some sense by demonstrating how virtuous you, virtuous you are to the world. Mm -hmm. It's like, you know, I'm, you go out there with a stick and a sign on it that says, I'm against poverty. It's like, yeah, no kidding, man. <laughs> really. Like, who's, who's for poverty? No one's for poverty. So it's, it's, 
it's, it's an abdication of responsibility with the mask of social virtue. When you want to solve a difficult problem is you figure out how to get along with your brother, the one you've been fighting with for five years, or see if you can staple your family back together. See if you can stop fighting with your girlfriend and have a relationship that lasts for more than two weeks. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like there are things that you should be doing in the confines of your own life that are private and humble, that would, that would, that would constitute genuine accomplishments, and those are the things that you should attend to. And no one's going to come along and say, hey, you know, good job, you're, you're changing the world. Because it's, it's private, but it's real. And then people don't do that. And so, no, I don't, I don't trust the activist, I, I don't trust the activist ethos at all. Hmm. I think it, I think everything about it is, is superficial and, and trendy and, and too easy. And, and it externalizes the blame. The evil is always elsewhere, which is a dreadful mistake to make because the evil isn't elsewhere. That's, that's the thing that you understand when you're wise, hmm. is the evil is not elsewhere.